that's the sort of rate of change you have to bring about. If we can't do that, then we have to sort of say, well, accept these much later, much higher and great, greater levels of uh, emissions and hence um, impacts and hence more violence, I suppose. So it comes back down to us. If you follow the 80-20 rule, 80% of emissions come from 20% of the population, run that through three times, and that broadly holds most things in life. That shows that 50% of the world's emissions are a responsibility of 1% of the population. So if it's a population problem, it's 1% you need to get rid of. And we know who they are, they live in this room. <laughs> that's all of us. We would be the ones you get rid of. Right, so that's 3.3% uh, over the last five years. Now let's just look at CO2e, and this is why I think there's some real concerns here, because the CO2e gases, which are the other basket of six gases, and there are other gases outside those as well, the impact of healthy aerosols, which, which cool it down to some extent. 2.8% since 2000 growth rate. Now Stern had lots of money at his disposal. It's one of those fancy universities. So why is he here putting the growth rate since 2000 was only 0.96%? His, his report came out in 2006 to be that far out in the empirical data because he couldn't be bothered to talk to the bean counters. So he just extrapolated the trend data from the 1990s and got it wildly wrong. And then that report goes around the world saying this is what we need to do on climate change. It's just, I mean, I think that was an absolute disgrace. I quite like the Stone report to use, because basically it was a zero discount rate. And that's what I liked. His, his, um, his maths and his science, well, he's an economist, so he not too much. Um, <laughs> but you think, but just think the difference there isn't a one year difference, this is a cumulative impact difference. So the curves are completely different for the reality compared to the stern. And we've had this sort of cock up for a long time. Here's the S res scenarios, in other words, what we thought might happen if we sort of guessed at that in the 1990s, from the worst situation to the best situation in terms of emissions. And a lot of people argued at the time that the worst ones were just were completely over the top, would never be anywhere near the worst ones. Well, there's the data. We're running along the, the worst line. And it's actually got worse than that. All of our talk on climate change, I think we must be talking with methane going out of our mouths and talking about it, because the emissions have gone up dramatically, way, way, way above the worst we thought was possible in the 1990s. So things are looking really quite dire now. Stern's got the numbers all over the place. We're way above, above the worst we thought was possible. And we're talking merely about climate change and without actually produ producing any or providing any action at all. Now let's add into this issues of um, land use. Land use is hugely important and we were really surprised when we started to try and get some decent data on this. For deforestation particularly, the emissions are, you know, the, um, the estimates are um, 12 to 25%. The lowest estimate is half the highest estimate, so we haven't got much of an idea of what the emissions are from deforestation. It's very difficult to actually work it out. You can use satellite data, you can use empirical data going in and sort of measuring the squares and see what happens. Um, and if you try those different approaches, you get a huge difference. And it's 20 to 25 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. So we really need to get some sort of handle on what's happening principally from deforestation. What we did in our scenarios, the scenarios, the results are going to come out of this, they look really quite pessimistic. But they're not business as usual. We took the most optimistic um, assumptions we could make really on forestry. And we were criticised by quite a few people, including some of the NGOs, for being too optimistic on trying to drive down deforestation. And the most optimistic scenario in the, in the literature we could find said that by the end of the century, 70% um, of all of the carbon stored in the current forest would still be in the forest. In other words, we wouldn't have chopped down 70%, so we only chopped down 30%. Um, and that's the most optimistic one in the literature. Most of them are way above that, far higher rates of deforestation. But we said, right, we'll take the best one in that literature, and let's be really, really optimistic and add another one. So we had another one where we would only chop down 20% of the forests. If you look at the Amazon recently, actually, the rates of, over the last two years, the rate of deforestation has increased significantly. For a number of reasons, actually, which are quite interesting cultural reasons for why it's gone up there. Um, so we've been very optimistic compared to what's out there in the literature. And this, these are the emissions from deforestation in our paper. Um, and the, more commonly, they're probably the, 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 the sort of mean data in the literature would actually have it going up like this. Remember, it's the area under the curve methods. That's the most opti optimistic one, and that's our one. So emissions are basically to stop deforestation somewhere um, towards the end of the century. Now let's look at the other non-greenhouse gas emissions. We've taken the EPA estimates for the short term. Um, that's the um, yeah, American Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and these are, these are characterized significantly by the fact that you can't get emissions, non greenhouse gas emissions, down to zero whilst you've got humans on the planet. Um, because we, we, we quite like eating. And um, if you eat meat, you're a real, it's a real problem. Um, but, so, what we've assumed here is a certain tail at the back end of this um, produced for the agriculture to feed, and we assume 9 billion people here by 2050, um, which is as, as good a guess as anyone else's, I think. Um, it's about 20 to 23% currently of total emissions. And they're the plots that we made for these. Now we had 
um, these emissions from non-greenhouse gases stabilising 2015, 2020, 2025. And that's the tail we have going on. Basically, that is to feed us. That's CO2. That's, sorry, that's basically methane involved agricultural processes. And that's half of the current methane per calorie of food produced. So that's a far, far more efficient production of food than we have today. And if you've got to think about 9 billion people on the planet, this is that, you know, we really have to dramatically improve um, our agricultural practices. We're going to feed them and not um, have higher emissions than that. Now let's look at peaks. Well, he's still present at the moment. Um, Bush suggests that it's 2025 when the US will peak its CO2 emissions. <coughs> Stern's used 2015. Seven years from now, Stern thinks the global peak is emissions. Now, unless he actually instigates credit cuts and things in the long term, I'm not quite sure how he ever came up with that number. And most people talk about Stern, never make the note, but he said global emissions will peak by 2015. There's no evidence of that at all, though the credit crunch or the, the, the global recession might be in that direction. So we took three, 2015, 2020, 2025, as to be where, where the global peaks might be. Um, two degrees C, these are taken from, for those who are interested in that stuff, this, this is mid range of mine towers and curves, so that's about 450 CO2E. So the middle, middle sort of curves. I mean, this, the relationship between these and these, as I say, is quite a, there's quite a discrepancy. But that's, this takes about the middle of that. So there's a 50 50 chance of two degrees C with these numbers now. That's the budget you get out of the IPCC report. And look at the difference. It's a huge difference. So that, and these are, all, these are all with carbon cycle feedbacks. So that's the difference for the cumulative value. That's how much you can dump out in the atmosphere between 2000 and 2100 to give you a 50% chance of two degrees C. And that's the variation you get out of the models. Um, if you plot that variation, so we've got that's how much we can dump out. We know we've got the forest use emissions built in now. We've got the, um, the non-CO2 emissions built in, so, and we know how much we can dump out. So you can start to plot. I mean, if we take the three peaks, 2020, 20, 2015, 2020, 2025, you plot the three peaks to what they look like. Those ranges, again, related to the ranges in those cumulative values and the science. But it doesn't matter what those ranges are. They, regardless of the peak, they're all lemmings off a cliff. So that's the reduction rate you'd need, assuming no other nasty feedbacks, of course. That's the reduction rate you'd need to bring about a 50% chance of 452, uh, 450 degree, um, 450 ppmv, about 2 degrees C. So that's a 50-50 chance of 2 degrees C, lemming us off a cliff, pretty much. So if we look at that in a little bit more detail, this is why I said it comes back down to us, because there's no option for, you know, changing, for not changing our behavior this afternoon if we want to go for 2 degrees C. This is the 2020 one. Let's assume global emissions peak in 2020. Then what you require, even at the most optimistic end of the IPCC's cumulative range, are reductions of 10% per annum globally. 10% every single year, globally. Now, if you think that places like Brazil, China, and India are likely going to peak after the OECD countries, which doesn't seem an unreasonable assumption given they haven't pumped that much in the past, then you might argue that we'd have to be way above this. 15, 20% per annum reductions. So they start to become meaningless figures, actually virtually decarbonize overnight. That's for two degrees, a 50, 50 chance of two degrees C. If you do that same analysis for three and four degrees C, and this is a more of a concern, so in, once you get to these sort of temperatures, my understanding and I'll uh, about the David Superior knowledge of this is that you're far more likely to see other feedbacks kicking in and making things get a lot worse. But let's assume that they don't occur. That's 550 and 650 parts per million CO2E roughly. For three degrees C, if you peak in 2020, You'd need 6% reductions in CO2e globally. That's about 9% from energy. So that's for 2020 people. That's for 550 people in the uh, 3 degrees C. For 4 degrees C, which is I just think we're a world we shouldn't even be con contemplating. And perhaps if we knew what 4 degrees C looked like in terms of impacts, we would never dream of going there. Um, but unfortunately, because we're, we're, we're sort of subverted by the rhetoric of 2 degrees C, we have very little impact data on 4 degrees C. For 4 degrees C, 3% reductions in CO2e. These look slightly more usable numbers now, and 3.5% from energy. But again, that's probably 6 to 10% from the OECD countries by 2020 to allow the other countries to carry on emitting a little bit longer. 